What's up? I'm Tom Seven, and this is a video version of my paper for Sigbovic 2013. The paper is called The First Level of Super Mario Brothers is Easy with Lexicographic Orderings and Time Travel. After that, it gets a little bit hard. That's also part of the title of the paper. It's a long title. I want to make sure I get everything in there so it's accurate because unlike most Sigbovic work, this is a real paper with real results. What this paper is basically about is, um, you know, the Nintendo Entertainment System is a very tiny computer. Uh, Nintendo only has two kilobytes of RAM. Tiny, tiny amount of RAM. You could see it. Maybe I'll stick something in the video there that's like small so you can see how small 2048 bytes is. It's tiny. So I thought, what kinds of really simple, sort of amusingly simple um, techniques can be used to automate Nintendo game playing. What I do, here's the basic idea. I take a, um, take a video of me playing the game, and by video I mean I just record the button presses that I, uh, that I pressed while I was playing the game. So let's say it's Super Mario Brothers. Play Super Mario Brothers a bit. I'd be at like a level. I'm like jumping around Mario, stomping some Goombas, riding some flagpoles, going to pipes, whatever. At every step, I save the memory. From my, from my own inputs. So I just have a 2048 2, bytes from this frame and 2048 bytes over and over and over and over again, six times a second, for however long I play. And then I play for, say, a couple thousand frames. So now I have a couple thousand memories, like in a cube, data cube. Um, and then the idea is this. I want to figure out, as a computer program, I want to figure out what does Tom think this game, um, what it means to win this game, right? And I constrain this to a very simple notion of winning, like what does it mean to win Super Mario Brothers versus Tetris or some other game? And the, the notion is um, the bytes in memory uh, should be going up, or some of the bytes should be getting bigger, because that's, you know, that's winning, like your score goes up, or whatever. And actually it's a little bit more complicated than the bytes go up, because if you think about my score, my score is multiple different bytes, because it can get higher than 256, the largest byte. Or maybe a simpler example would be, more intuitive example would be, Mario starts on world 1-2, sorry, 1-1, then he goes to 1-2, 1-3, 1-4, but then he's on 2-1, and so that, that dash part, that goes up for a while, but then it goes down, and then the next one goes up. And that actually, that pattern is very common and it's mathematically nice and that's called a lexicographic ordering. It's the same way that we sort strings in the dictionary or anything like that. So, and here's the idea. Take all those RAMs from me playing the game, to old Tom7, your boy. <laughs> Take all those RAMs and try to figure out, find series of bytes, um, byte locations in memory that go up according to this lexicographic ordering. And that generalizes things like your score going up, multi-byte, little endian or big endian. It generalizes the idea of like Mario's position on the screen, his x-coordinate, inside sort of the, the screens within a, a level, and then the levels within a world, and so on. Um, and so it's very, very simple. You just can learn these things, and there's a nice algorithm for learning them. Then we can throw out all of the crap having to do with the game. And uh, in fact, we don't even need to see the output. The computer is just going to now take the ROM and it's going to emulate it. And it's going to try out some inputs and see if it makes those bytes go up in the memory. And it completely ignores anything that a human would be looking at or, or listening to, like the video or the sound effects or anything like that. It's just looking at RAMs. And it's trying to find sequences of inputs that make those orderings go up in RAM. Uh, and this is, uh, the best thing I would say about this is that it works great. So um, you get to do some work to make it work, but I'll show you some videos of Super Mario um, playing by himself and doing pretty well. In fact, doing some things that humans uh, wouldn't do, <laughs> let's just put it that way. And some of those are great and some of those are really stupid. Uh, the, the approach is really pretty general. Um, which is part of the design goal, so I didn't try to... I mean, there's lots of easier ways to play Super Mario Brothers, let me just be clear. For example, you could just play it. Or you could <laughs> single step through and deduce what are the best inputs by yourself. Or you could program some kind of heuristic 
that looked at Mario's lives, and it knew things like where are the Goombas on the screen and how to jump on them. And that's what a, a person that didn't care about the aesthetics of automating um, Nintendo games would do, I think, because they would be more concerned with results. And I'm mostly concerned with the aesthetics. And so the aesthetic here is this is a really simple, mathematically elegant, and stupid technique um, that works great. And it works great for other games too. So I'm going to show you several videos of um, you know Mario playing funny or Pac-Man or whatever, doing some crazy stuff. And uh, I'll also show you some videos of it failing badly on games where this doesn't make any sense or maybe because my program sucks or whatever. And uh, that's it. And you can read more about this on the website, tom7.org slash Mario. Uh, or watch videos, watch full videos of the playthroughs, or download the source code, or read the extended technical report, which explains all of the details. Um, but who likes reading? I mean, come on, it's 2013. So let's get into it. So this is a video of me playing Super Mario Brothers. I'm pretty good at this game. It's like I just got that that thing that made me big. And uh, this is the input training data to the procedure, which is called learn fun. Learn fun for learn function. We learn a bunch of those lexicographic orderings that I was talking about before from the memories that are being saved for each of these steps. Oh, look at that move. That was really cool. Well, anyway, so teaching, teaching the computer program how to play this game right now. Oh, let's, let's just... Okay, so then I have those inputs, and I can give them to this program called Learn Fun, which will deduce lexicographic orderings that the memories of the game at each frame obey. And here's an example of one of those lexicographic orderings. The most significant location is 232, decimal memory location 232, and they go down from there. And this graph is just sort of showing the value that this function takes on over time. And you could read the paper for all of the details. Now it turns out you don't only want objective functions that are globally valid like this one because for example you saw me turn around to jump up sort of to the left and get that flower and so what we do is we run the same function on different slices of the memory um, in order to produce lots and lots of objective functions some of which will be momentarily violated and here's what that looks like and this is what it looks like to use that objective function to automate the game completely idiotic Mario is just pressing buttons randomly, jumping around in place, and eventually dies of old age. Uh, the search strategy that you use with those objective functions matter, and here I'm using just a completely greedy one. Here's my second approach, which works a little bit better. Mario's looking a few frames into the future, uh, still pressing buttons like crazy, and jumping backwards for some reason. Um, too spastic to make it over this pipe, and gets stuck there forever, and dies of old age. So fast forward a few weekends, and now it's actually looking pretty good. Software has a name now, which is PlayFun, and this version actually more or less resembles what the software is like today. And the key insight here is to keep track of a bunch of random future inputs that we might execute, and then plan relative to those. And so what's going to allow Mario to jump over this pipe here is he's going to try a bunch of short sequences, all of the short sequences, and then a bunch of those random futures. And one of them is keep holding A and hold right one of those random futures, and that allows him to put together a sequence of moves that seems sort of coherent. And so that works pretty well, and actually you can see he's playing like a human, um, except getting really close to those Goombas, and doing pretty well, and then just jumps in the pit. I don't know why. So I worked on making the program better, and I made graphics like this one to help me diagnose, and I just like this graphic, doesn't matter what it means. And finally Mario is able to beat World 1-1 pretty much every time. Uh, no problem, and can even do some pretty fancy trick stuff like this. Then you gotta kick that guy over there, clear the way. That's awesome. But he loves coins, and he loves this little spot right here, which is a dead end. He goes up here, makes his score bigger, and he just can't figure out why he can't go through that wall, and he dies of old age. Now, while I was writing up the paper for Sigbovic, thinking this is as good as it gets, I actually discovered a bug in LearnFun. Um, as I was trying to describe part of the waiting algorithm. And when I came back, I fixed that uh, and had an immediate breakthrough. And here's what it looks like to play today. Got those coins, and no problem with this part anymore. Mario 
can see, and what was that? That was actually Mario exploiting a bug in the game, um, whereby you can stomp Goombas from the bottom, or other monsters. And I'll show you another example of that, maybe in slow motion in the next level. And Mario's not having any problems with this game anymore. Stomping a turtle. You gotta break all these bricks, because these give you 50 points a pop. It's like money in the bank. And let's just skip this part. Mario! Why would you do that? Anyway, I think that one is explainable. I think what Mario was basically doing was just finding a quick way to reset back to the beginning there, because he's doing a fine job. And then here's this move again. Let me show you that one in slow motion. Basically, as long as Mario's moving down, and you'll see he moves just down a little bit, he always stomps an enemy. He's invincible when he's moving down. Fun Mario fact brought to you by PlayFun. And almost makes it, and that's as far as it gets today. So here's some other games where it works or doesn't work. And these are played with the exact same settings. This is a game called The Karate Kid, which really does not do justice to the film. And the whole game is really obnoxious, has terrible controls, uh, but it starts with this annoying karate tournament, which I thought I might be able to beat. Uh, Daniel San, he completely wastes his power moves right right here. He just sure use both crane kicks on this noob. And now you gotta fight this guy, and you're out of crane kicks, so now you're done for. And he doesn't do well. Uh, possibly this is because the pro notion of progress here is actually the enemy's life going down, not anything going up. Um, here he gets to a tie, actually. But in this dirty game, which I hate, a tie goes to the the bad guy. Because, you know, why would you want kids to win a karate tournament and feel good about themselves? You lost. Sorry. Let's go back to a game that does work. This is one called Hudson's Adventure Island. And it still eludes me to this day why Hudson would put their name in the title of this ridiculous game. It is likable, but it's a very difficult game owing mostly to its controls. There aren't really that many obstacles, um, but this little island guy, his name is Master Higgins. He is so fragile, he dies upon touching almost anything. Um, and he has to wear a helmet when he skateboards, how lame is that, right? And so this game is mostly a go to the right and jump um, and throw hammers at birds. and. Playfront is great at this. Uh, it anticipates enemies that are off screen and throws a throws a hammer just in time to kill them as they arrive. Um, and it plays through this game about twice as far as the input sequence I gave to train it, which is pretty impressive. Now, I'm not going to show you the whole thing because this goes on for three minutes. That was not impressive. But Playfun generally does pretty well on this game. And uh, it kind of suggests that games that are like this, where you basically want to move right and avoid obstacles, are in fact easy with lexicographic orderings and time travel. Let's see if it works on games that aren't like that. Like, say, Pac-Man. Oh god. Wait a sec. What the? Okay. Alright. So, in this game, there's no spatial gradient, there's no scrolling, there's no going right or up or anything is better. But there are these dots which increase your score, and the score might actually be the only interesting thing that guides the player's progress. And Pac-Man plays very strangely, um, but he is pretty good at avoiding ghosts, and I'm going to fast forward here to my favorite part. Okay, so what would you do in this situation? Like that? I love these trick moves like this. Here's an example of Mario exploding another bug. That's pretty cool. Don't know how that one works. This is one of my favorite games of all time, Bubble Bobble. And I was expecting it to not work at all. Like, maybe he would just sit in the corner like this and then die. Just like that. Because it's a single screen, there's no score gradients or anything to help you out. Um, but right after the beginning, Bub, which is this dinosaur, this bubbled dinosaur, starts getting pretty good at this game. And watch this, this is totally pro. 
And in fact, in this game, the automated version by Playfun gets farther than the input sequence that I gave it, which is um, really surprising. And here he's shooting guys from behind, which I didn't even know was possible. Finally, Tetris. Oh boy. Having some trouble with those menus. So this game does not work well at all, and that's not surprising. Uh, playing Tetris well requires some thinking ahead, and this algorithm does not think very far ahead. There it was, pausing the game for no reason. And I think the reason it stacks up the blocks like that, um, which is the worst possible Tetris strategy, is that it gets three points or so when it puts a block on top of another block. So this is really bad, greedy planning. And let's force fast forward a bit to see how this all ends. It's not good. So now it's almost done and pauses the game because as soon as he unpauses, he will lose. And really, the only winning move is not to play. Thank you.